Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Deserted House by Ernest Theodore Amadeus Hoffman. It was first published in Volume 2 of Hoffman's Night Stories in 1817. This version appears in a 1917 collection of ghost stories with no translator attribution. It is not actually a ghost story. It is, as one might expect from Hoffman, a strange and supernatural tale full of dim imaginings and gothic flourishes. It is perfect for Halloween. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. You know already that I spent the greater part of last summer in X, began Theodore. The many old friends and acquaintances I found there, the free, jovial life, the manifold artistic and intellectual interests, all these combined to keep me in that city. I was happy as never before, and found rich nourishment for my old fondness for wandering alone through the streets, stopping to enjoy every picture in the shop windows, every placard on the walls, or watching the passers-by, and choosing some one or the other of them to cast his horoscope secretly to myself. There is one broad avenue leading to the blank gate, and lined with handsome buildings of all descriptions, which is the meeting place of the rich and fashionable world. The shops which occupy the ground floor of the tall palaces are devoted to the trade in articles of luxury, and the apartments above are the dwellings of people of wealth and position. The aristocratic hotels are to be found in this avenue, the palaces of the foreign ambassadors are there, and you can easily imagine that such a street would be the center of the city's life and gaiety. I had wandered through the avenue several times, when, one day, my attention was caught by a house which contrasted strangely with the other surrounding it. Picture to yourselves a low building, but four windows broad, crowded in between two tall, handsome structures. Its one upper story was a little higher than the tops of the ground-floor windows of its neighbors. Its roof was dilapidated, its windows patched with paper, its discolored walls spoke of years of neglect. You can imagine how strange such a house must have looked in this street of wealth and fashion. Looking at it more attentively, I perceived that the windows of the upper story were tightly closed and curtained, and that a wall had been built to hide the windows of the ground floor. The entrance gate, a little to one side, served also as a doorway for the building, but I could find no sign of latch, lock, or even a bell on this gate. I was convinced that the house must be unoccupied, for at whatever hour of the day I happened to be passing, I had never seen the faintest signs of life about it. You all, the good comrades of my youth, know that I have been prone to consider myself a sort of clairvoyant, claiming to have glimpses of a strange world of wonders, a world which you, with your hard common sense, would attempt to deny or laugh away. I confess that I have often lost myself in mysteries, which, after all, turned out to be no mysteries at all. And it looked at first as if this was to happen to me in the matter of the deserted house, that strange house which drew my steps and thoughts to itself with the power that surprised me. But the point of my story will prove to you that I am right in asserting that I know more than you do. Listen now to what I am about to tell you. One day, at the hour in which the fashionable world is accustomed to promenade up and down the avenue, I stood, as usual, before the deserted house, lost in thought. Suddenly I felt, without looking up, that someone had stopped beside me, fixing his eyes on me. It was Count P., who told me that the old house contained nothing more mysterious than a cake bakery belonging to the pastry cook whose handsome shop adjoined the old structure. The windows of the ground floor were walled up to give protection to the ovens, and the heavy curtains of the upper story were to keep sunlight from the wares laid out there. When the Count informed me of this, I felt as if a bucket of cold water had been suddenly thrown over me, but I could not believe in this story of the cake and candy factory. 
through some strange freak of the imagination i felt as a child feels when some fairy tale has been told it to conceal the truth it suspects i scolded myself for a silly fool the house remained unaltered in its appearance and the visions faded in my brain until one day a chance incident woke them to life again I was wandering through the avenue as usual, and as I passed the deserted house, I could not resist a hasty glance at its close-curtained upper windows. But as I looked at it, the curtain on the last window near the pastry shop began to move. A hand, an arm, came out from between its folds. I took my opera glass from my pocket and saw a beautifully formed woman's hand, on the little finger of which a large diamond sparkled in unusual brilliancy. A rich bracelet glittered on the white, rounded arm. The hand set a tall, oddly formed crystal bottle on the window ledge and disappeared again behind the curtain. I stopped as if frozen to stone. A weirdly pleasurable sensation, mingled with awe, streamed through my being with the warmth of an electric current. I stared up at the mysterious window, and a sigh of longing arose from the very depths of my heart. When I came to myself again, I was angered to find that I was surrounded by a crowd which stood gazing up at the window with curious faces. I stole away inconspicuously, and the demon of all things prosaic whispered to me that what I had just seen was the rich pastry cook's wife in her Sunday adornment, placing an empty bottle used for rose water or the like on the windowsill. Nothing very weird about this. Suddenly, a most sensible thought came to me. I turned and entered the shining mirror-walled shop of the pastry cook. Blowing the steaming foam from my cup of chocolate, I remarked, You have a very useful addition to your establishment next door. The man leaned over his counter and looked at me with a questioning smile, as if he didn't understand me. I repeated that in my opinion he had been very clever to set his bakery in the neighboring house, though the deserted appearance of the building was a strange sight in its contrasting surroundings. Why, sir, began the pastry cook, who told you that the house next door belongs to us? Unfortunately, every attempt on our part to acquire it has been in vain, and I fancy it is all the better so, for there is something queer about the place. You can imagine, dear friends, how interested I became upon hearing these words, and that I begged the man to tell me more about the house. I do not know anything very definite, sir, he said. All that we know for a certainty is that the house belongs to the Countess S., who lives on her estates and has not been to the city for years. This house, so they tell me, stood in its present shape before any of the handsome buildings were raised, which are now the pride of our avenue, and in all these years there's been nothing done to it except to keep it from actual decay. Two living creatures alone dwell there, an aged misanthrope of a steward and his melancholy dog, which occasionally howls at the moon from the back courtyard. According to the general story, the deserted house is haunted. In very truth, my brother, who is the owner of this shop, and myself, have often, when our business kept us awake during the silence of the night, heard strange sounds from the other side of the walls. There was a rumbling and a scraping that frightened us both. And not very long ago, we heard one night a strange singing, which I could not describe to you. It was evidently the voice of an old woman, but the tones were so sharp and clear, and ran up to the top of the scale in cadences and long trills, the like of which I have never heard before, although I have heard many singers in many lands. It seemed to be a French song, but I am not quite sure of that, for I could not long listen to the mad, ghostly singing. It made the hair stand erect on my head. And at times, after the street noises are quiet, we can hear deep sighs, and sometimes a mad laugh which seems to come out of the earth. But if you lay your ear to the wall in our back room, you can hear that the noises come from the house next door. He led me into the back room and pointed through the window. And do you see that iron chimney coming out of the wall there? It smokes so heavily sometimes, even in summer when there are no fires used, that my brother has often quarreled with the old steward about it, fearing danger. 
but the old man excuses himself by saying that he was cooking his food. Heaven knows what the queer creature may eat, for often when the pipe is smoking heavily, a strange and queer smell can be smelled all over the house. The glass doors of the shop creaked in opening. The pastry cook hurried into the front room, and when he had nodded to the figure now entering, he threw a meaning glance at me. I understood him perfectly. Who else could this strange guest be but the steward who had charge of the mysterious house? Imagine a thin little man with a face the color of a mummy, with a sharp nose, tight-set lips, green cat's eyes, and a crazy smile, his hair dressed in the old-fashioned style, with a high toupee and a bag at the back, and heavily powdered. He wore a faded old brown coat, which was carefully brushed, gray stockings, and broad, flat-toed shoes with buckles. And imagine further that in spite of his meagerness, this little person is robustly built with huge fists and long, strong fingers, and that he walks to the shop counter with a strong, firm step, smiling his imbecile smile and whining out, A couple of candied oranges, a couple of macaroons, a couple of sugared chestnuts. The pastry cook smiled at me and then spoke to the old man. You do not seem to be quite well. Yes, yes, old age, old age. It does take the strength from our limbs. The old man's expression did not change, but his voice went up. Old age? Old age? Lose strength? Grow weak? Ho oh ho! And with this, he clapped his hands together until the joints cracked and sprang high up into the air until the entire shop trembled and the glass vessels on the walls and counters rattled and shook. But in the same moment, a hideous screaming was heard. The old man had stepped on his black dog, which, creeping in behind him, had laid itself at his feet on the floor. Devilish beast! Dog of hell! groaned the old man in his former miserable tone, opening his bag and giving the dog a large macaroon. The dog, which had burst out into a cry of distress that was truly human, was quiet at once, sat down on its haunches, and gnawed at the macaroon like a squirrel. When it had finished its tidbit, the old man had also finished packing up and putting away his purchases. "'Good night, honored neighbor,' he spoke, taking the hand of the pastry cook and pressing it until the latter cried aloud in pain. The weak old man wishes you a good night, most honorable sir, neighbor, he repeated, and then walked from the shop, followed closely by his black dog. The old man did not seem to have noticed me at all. I was quite dumbfounded in my astonishment. There you see, began the pastry cook, this is the way he acts when he comes in here, two or three times a month it is. But I can get nothing out of him except the fact that he was a former valet of Count S, that he is now in charge of this house here, and that every day, for many years now, he expects the arrival of his master's family. The hour was now come when fashion demanded that the elegant world of the city should assemble in this attractive shop. The doors opened incessantly, the place was thronged, and I could ask no further questions. This much I knew, that Count P's information about the ownership and use of the house were not correct. Also, that the old steward, in spite of his denial, was not living alone there, and that some mystery was hidden behind its discolored walls. How could I combine the story of the strange and gruesome singing with the appearance of the beautiful arm at the window? That arm could not be part of the wrinkly body of an old woman. The singing, according to the pastry cook story, could not come from the throat of a blooming and youthful maiden. I decided in favor of the arm, as it was easy to explain to myself that some trick of acoustics had made the voice sound sharp and old, or that it appeared so only in the pastry cook's fear-distorted imagination. Then I thought of the smoke, the strange odors, the oddly formed crystal bottle that I had seen, and soon the vision of a beautiful creature, held enthralled by fatal magic, stood as if alive before my mental vision. The old man became a wizard, who, perhaps quite independently of the family he served, had set up his devil's kitchen in the deserted house. 
My imagination had begun to work, and in my dreams that night I saw clearly the hand with the sparkling diamond on its finger, the arm with the shining bracelet. From out thin gray mists there appeared a sweet face with sadly imploring blue eyes, then the entire exquisite figure of a beautiful girl. And I saw that what I had thought was mist was the fine steam flowing out in circles from a crystal bottle held in the hands of the vision. Oh, fairest creature of my dreams, I cried in rapture. Reveal to me where thou art, what it is that enthralls thee. Ah, I know it. It is black magic that holds thee captive. Thou art the unhappy slave of that malicious devil who wanders about, brown-clad and bewigged in pastry shops, scattering their wares with his unholy springing and feeding his demon dog on macaroons after they have howled out a satanic measure in five-eighth time. Oh, I know it all, thou fair and charming vision. The diamond is the reflection of the fire of thy heart. But that bracelet about thine arm is a link of the chain which the brown-clad one says is a magnetic chain. Do not believe it, O glorious one. See how it shines in the blue fire from the retort. One moment more and thou art free. And now, O maiden, open thy rosebud mouth and tell me. In this moment, a gnarled fist leapt over my shoulder and clutched at the crystal bottle, which sprang into a thousand pieces in the air. With a faint, sad moan, the charming vision faded into the blackness of the night. When morning came to put an end to my dreaming, I hurried through the avenue, seeking the deserted house as usual, and I saw something glistening in the last window of the upper story. Coming nearer, I noticed that the outer blind had been quite drawn up and the inner curtain slightly opened. The sparkle of a diamond met my eye. Oh, kind heaven! The face of my dream looked at me, gently imploring, from above the rounded arm on which her head was resting. But how was it possible to stand still in the moving crowd without attracting attention? Suddenly, I caught sight of the benches placed in the gravel walk in the center of the avenue, and I saw that one of them was directly opposite the house. I sprang over to it, and, leaning over its back, I could stare up at the mysterious window undisturbed. Yes, it was she, the charming maiden of my dream. But her eye did not seem to seek me as I had at first thought. Her glance was cold and unfocused, and had it not been for an occasional motion of the hand and arm, I might have thought that I was looking at a cleverly painted picture. I was so lost in my adoration of the mysterious being at the window, so aroused and excited through all my nerve centers, that I did not hear the shrill voice of an Italian street hawker who had been offering me his wares for some time. Finally, he touched me on the arm. I turned hastily and commanded him to let me alone. But he did not cease his entreaties, asserting that he had earned nothing today and begging me to buy some small trifle from him. Full of impatience to get rid of him, I put my hand in my pocket. With the words, I have more beautiful things here, he opened the under drawer of his box and held out to me a little, round pocket mirror. In it, as he held it up before my face, I could see the deserted house behind me, the window, and the sweet face of my vision there. I bought the little mirror at once, for I saw that it would make it possible for me to sit comfortable and inconspicuously, and yet watch the window. The longer I looked at the reflection in the glass, the more I fell captive to a weird and quite indescribable sensation, which I might almost call a waking dream. It was as if a lethargy had lamed my eyes, holding them fastened on the glass beyond my power to loosen them, and now, at last, the beautiful eyes of the fair vision looked at me, her glance sought mine, and shone deep down into my heart. "'You have a pretty little mirror there,' said a voice beside me. I awoke from my dream, and was not a little confused when I saw smiling faces looking at me from either side. Several persons had sat down upon the bench, and it was quite certain that my staring into the window, and my probably strange expression, had afforded them great cause for amusement. "'You have a pretty little mirror there,' repeated the man, as I did not answer him. 
His glance said more, and asked without words the reason of my staring so oddly into the little glass. He was an elderly man, neatly dressed, and his voice and eyes were so full of good nature that I could not refuse him my confidence. I told him that I had been looking in the mirror at the picture of a beautiful maiden who was sitting at the window of the deserted house. I went even farther. I asked the old man if he had not seen the fair face himself. Over there? In the old house? In the last window? He repeated my questions in a tone of surprise. Yes, yes, I exclaimed. The old man smiled and answered, Well, well, that was a strange delusion. My old eyes, thank heaven for my old eyes. Yes, yes, sir, I saw a pretty face in the window there with my own eyes, but it seemed to me to be an excellently well-painted oil portrait. I turned quickly and looked at the window. There was no one there, and the blind had been pulled down. Yes, continued the old man. Yes, sir, now it is too late to make sure of the matter, for just now the servant, who, as I know, lives there alone in the house of the Countess S., took the picture away from the window after he had dusted it and let down the blinds. Was it, then, surely a picture? I asked again in bewilderment. You can trust my eyes, replied the old man. The optical delusion was strengthened by your seeing only the reflection in the mirror, and when I was in your years it was easy enough for my fancy to call up the picture of a beautiful maiden. But the hand and arm moved, I exclaimed. Oh, yes, they moved, indeed they moved, said the old man, smiling as he patted me on the shoulder. Then he arose to go, and, bowing politely, closed his remarks with the words, Beware of mirrors which can lie so vividly. Your obedient servant, sir. You can imagine how I felt when I saw that he looked upon me as a foolish fantasist. I hurried home full of anger and disgust, and promised myself that I would not think of the mysterious house. But I placed the mirror on my dressing table, that I might bind my cravat before it, and thus it happened one day, when I was about to utilize it for this important business, that its glass seemed dull, and that I took it up and breathed on it to rub it bright again. My heart seemed to stand still, every fiber in me trembled in delightful awe. Yes, that is all the name I can find for the feeling that came over me when, as my breath clouded the little mirror, I saw the beautiful face of my dreams arise and smile at me through the blue mists. You laugh at me? You look upon me as an incorrigible dreamer? Think what you will about it. The fair face looked at me from out of the mirror. But as soon as the clouding vanished, the face vanished in the brightened glass. I will not weary you with a detailed recital of my sensations the next few days. I will only say that I repeated again the experiments with the mirror, sometimes with success, and sometimes without. When I had not been able to call up the vision, I would run to the deserted house and stare up at the windows, but I saw no human being anywhere about the building. I lived only in thoughts of my vision. Everything else seemed indifferent to me. I neglected my friends and my studies. The tortures in my soul passed over into, or rather mingled with, physical sensations which frightened me, and which at last made me fear for my reason. One day, after an unusually severe attack, I put my little mirror in my pocket and hurried to the home of Dr. K., who was noted for his treatment of those diseases of the mind out of which physical diseases so often grow. I told him my story. I did not conceal the slightest incident from him, and I implored him to save me from the terrible fate which seemed to threaten me. He listened to me quietly, but I read astonishment in his glance. Then he said, The danger is not as near as you believe, and I think that I may say that it can be easily prevented. You are undergoing an unusual psychical disturbance, beyond a doubt. But the fact that you understand that some evil principle seems to be trying to influence you gives you a weapon by which you can combat it. Leave your little mirror here with me and force yourself to take up with some work which will afford scope for all your mental energy. Do not go to the avenue. Work all day from early to late. Then take a long walk and spend your evenings in the company of your friends. 
eat heartily, and drink heavy, nourishing wines. You see I am endeavoring to combat your fixed idea of the face in the window of the deserted house and in the mirror by diverting your mind to other things and by strengthening your body. You yourself must help me in this. I was very reluctant to part with my mirror. The physician, who had already taken it, seemed to notice my hesitation. He breathed upon the glass, and, holding it up to me, he asked, Do you see anything? Nothing at all, I answered, for so it was. Now breathe on the glass yourself, said the physician, laying the mirror in my hands. I did as he requested. There was the vision even more clearly than ever before. There she is, I cried aloud. The physician looked into the glass and then said, I cannot see anything, but I will confess to you that when I looked into this glass, a queer shiver overcame me, passing away almost at once. Now, do it once more. I breathed upon the glass again, and the physician laid his hand upon the back of my neck. The face appeared again, and the physician, looking into the mirror over my shoulder, turned pale. Then he took the little glass from my hands, looked at it attentively, and locked it into his desk, returning to me after a few moments' silent thought. Follow my instructions strictly, he said. I must confess to you that I do not yet understand those moments of your vision, but I hope to be able to tell you more about it very soon. Difficult as it was to me, I forced myself to live absolutely according to the doctor's orders. I soon felt the benefit of the steady work and the nourishing diet, and yet I was not free from those terrible attacks which would come either at noon or, more intensely still, at midnight. Even in the midst of a merry company, in the enjoyment of wine and song, glowing daggers seemed to pierce my heart, and all the strength of my intellect was powerless to resist their might over me. I was obliged to retire and could not return to my friends until I had recovered from my condition of lethargy. It was in one of those attacks, an unusually strong one, that such an irresistible, mad longing for the picture of my dreams came over me that I hurried out into the street and ran toward the mysterious house. While still at a distance from it, I seemed to see lights shining out through the fast-closed blinds, but when I came nearer, I saw that all was dark. Crazy with my desire, I rushed to the door and fell back before the pressure of my hands. I stood in the dimly lighted vestibule, enveloped in a heavy, close atmosphere. My heart beat in strange fear and impatience. Then suddenly a long, sharp tone, as from a woman's throat, shrilled through the house. I know not how it happened that I found myself suddenly in a great hall, brilliantly lighted and furnished in old-fashioned magnificence of golden chairs and strange Japanese ornaments. Strongly perfumed incense arose in blue clouds about me. Welcome, welcome, sweet bridegroom. The hour has come, our bridal hour. I heard these words in a woman's voice, and as little as I can tell how I came into the room, just so little do I know how it happened that suddenly a tall, youthful figure, richly dressed, seemed to arise from the blue mists. With the repeated shrill cry, Welcome, sweet bridegroom! She came toward me with outstretched arms, and a yellow face, distorted with age and madness, stared into mine. I fell back in terror, but the fiery, piercing glance of her eyes, like the eyes of a snake, seemed to hold me spellbound. I did not seem able to turn my eyes from this terrible old woman. I could not move another step. She came still nearer, and it seemed to me suddenly as if her hideous face were only a thin mask beneath which I saw the features of the beautiful maiden of my vision. Already I felt the touch of her hands when suddenly she fell at my feet with a loud scream, and a voice behind me cried, Oh, is the devil playing his tricks with your grace again? To bed! To bed, your grace, else there will be blows, mighty blows. I turned quickly and saw the old steward in his nightclothes swinging a whip above his head. He was about to strike the screaming figure at my feet when I caught his arm, but he shook me from him, exclaiming, The devil, sir! 
That old Satan would have murdered you if I had not come to your aid. Get away from here at once! I rushed from the hall and sought in vain in the darkness for the door of the house. Behind me I heard the hissing blows of the whip and the old woman's screams. I drew breath to call aloud for help, when suddenly the ground gave way under my feet. I fell down a short flight of stairs, bringing up with such force against a door at the bottom that it sprang open, and I measured my length on the floor of a small room. From the hastily vacated bed, and from the familiar brown coat hanging over a chair, I saw that I was in the bedchamber of the old steward. There was a trampling on the stair, and the old man himself entered hastily, throwing himself at my feet. "'By all the saints, sir,' he entreated with folded hands, "'whoever you may be, and however her grace, "'that old Satan of a witch has managed to entice you to this house, "'do not speak to any one of what has happened here. "'It will cost me my position. "'Her crazy excellency has been punished and is bound fast in her bed. "'Sleep well, good sir, sleep sweetly and softly. "'It is a warm and beautiful July night.' There is no moon, but the stars shine brightly. A quiet good night to you. While talking, the old man had taken up a lamp and had led me out of the basement, pushed me out of the house door, and locked it behind me. I hurried home quite bewildered, and you can imagine that I was too much confused by the gruesome secret to be able to form any explanation of it in my own mind for the first few days. Only this much was certain, that I was now free from the evil spell that had held me captive for so long. All my longing for the magic vision in the mirror had disappeared, and the memory of the scene in the deserted house was like the recollection of an unexpected visit to a madhouse. It was evident beyond a doubt that the steward was the tyrannical guardian of a crazy woman of noble birth, whose condition was to be hidden from the world. But the mirror... And all the other magic? Listen, and I will tell you more about it. Some few days later, I came upon Count P at an evening entertainment. He drew me to one side and said with a smile, Do you know that the secrets of our deserted house are beginning to be revealed? I listened with interest, but before the Count could say more, the doors of the dining room were thrown open and the company proceeded to the table. Quite lost in thought at the words I had just heard, I had given a young lady my arm, and had taken my place mechanically in the ceremonious procession. I led my companion to the seats arranged for us, and then turned to look at her for the first time. The vision of my mirror stood before me, feature for feature, there was no deception possible. I trembled to my innermost heart, as you can imagine, but I discovered that there was not the slightest echo, even in my heart, of the mad desire which had ruled me so entirely when my breath drew out the magic picture from the glass. My astonishment, or rather my terror, must have been apparent in my eyes. The girl looked at me in such surprise that I endeavored to control myself sufficiently to remark that I must have met her somewhere before. Her short answer, to the effect that this could hardly be possible, as she had come to the city only yesterday for the first time in her life, bewildered me still more and threw me into an awkward silence. The sweet glance from her gentle eyes brought back my courage, and I began a tentative exploring of this new companion's mind. I found that I had before me a sweet and delicate being, suffering from some psychic trouble. At a particularly merry turn of the conversation, when I would throw in a daring word like a dash of pepper, she would smile, but her smile was pained, as if a wound had been touched. "'You were not very merry tonight, Countess. Was it the visit this morning?' An officer sitting near us had spoken these words to my companion, but before he could finish his remarks, his neighbor had grasped him by the arm and whispered something in his ear, while a lady at the other side of the table, with glowing cheeks and angry eyes, began to talk loudly of the opera she had heard last evening. Tears came to the eyes of the girl sitting beside me. Am I not foolish? She turned to me. A few moments before she had complained of headache. Merely the usual evidences of a nervous headache, I answered in an easy tone, and there is nothing better for it than the merry spirit which bubbles in the foam of this poet's nectar. With these words I filled her champagne glass, and she sipped it as she threw me a look of gratitude. 
Her mood brightened, and all would have been well had I not touched a glass before me with unexpected strength, arousing from it a shrill, high tone. My companion grew deadly pale, and I myself felt a sudden shiver, for the sound had exactly the tone of the mad woman's voice in the deserted house. While we were drinking coffee, I made an opportunity to get to the side of Count P. He understood the reason for my movement. Do you know that your neighbor is Countess Edwina S.? And do you know also that it is her mother's sister who lives in the deserted house, incurably mad for many years? This morning, both mother and daughter went to see the unfortunate woman. The old steward, the only person who is able to control the countess in her outbreaks, is seriously ill, and they say that the sister has finally revealed the secret to Dr. K. Dr. K was the physician to whom I had turned in my own anxiety, and you can well imagine that I hurried to him as soon as I was free and told him all that had happened to me in the last days. I asked him to tell me as much as he could about the mad woman for my own peace of mind, and this is what I learned from him under promise of secrecy. Angelica, Countess Z, thus the doctor began, had already passed her thirtieth year, but was still in full possession of great beauty when Count S., although much younger than she, became so fascinated by her charm that he wooed her with ardent devotion and followed her to her father's home to try his luck there. But scarcely had the Count entered the house, scarcely had he caught sight of Angelica's younger sister, Gabrielle, when he awoke as from a dream. The elder sister appeared faded and colorless beside Gabrielle, whose beauty and charm so enthralled the Count that he begged her hand of her father. Count Z gave his consent easily, as there was no doubt of Gabrielle's feeling toward her suitor. Angelica did not show the slightest anger at her lover's faithlessness. He believes that he has forsaken me, the foolish boy. He does not perceive that he was but my toy, a toy of which I had tired. Thus she spoke in proud scorn, and not a look or an action on her part belied her words. But, after the ceremonious betrothal of Gabrielle to Count S., Angelica was seldom seen by the members of her family. She did not appear at the dinner table, and it was said that she spent most of her time walking alone in the neighboring wood. A strange occurrence disturbed the monotonous quiet of life in the castle. The hunters of Count Z, assisted by peasants from the village, had captured a band of gypsies who were accused of several robberies and murders which had happened recently in the neighborhood. The men were brought to the castle courtyard, fettered together on a long chain, while the women and children were packed in a cart. Noticeable among the last was a tall, haggard old woman of terrifying aspect, wrapped from head to foot in a red shawl. She stood upright in the cart, and in an imperious tone demanded that she should be allowed to descend. The guards were so awed by her manner and her appearance that they obeyed her at once. Count Z came down to the courtyard and commanded that the gang should be placed in the prisons under the castle. Suddenly, Countess Angelica rushed out of the door, her hair all loose, fear and anxiety in her pale face. Throwing herself on her knees, she cried in a piercing voice, Let these people go! Let these people go! They are innocent! Father, let these people go! If you shed one drop of their blood, I will pierce my heart with this knife! The Countess swung a shining knife in the air and then sank swooning to the ground. Yes, my beautiful darling, my golden child, I knew you would not let them hurt us, shrilled the old woman in red. She cowered beside the countess and pressed disgusting kisses to her face and breast, murmuring crazy words. She took from out the recesses of her shawl a little vial in which a tiny goldfish seemed to swim in some silver-clear liquid. She held the vial to the countess's heart. The latter regained consciousness immediately. When her eyes fell on the gypsy woman, she sprang up, clasped the old creature ardently in her arms, and hurried with her into the castle. Count Z, Gabrielle, and her lover, who had come out during this scene, watched it in astonished awe. The gypsies appeared quite indifferent. They were loosed from their chains and taken separately to the prisons. 
Next morning, Count Z called the villagers together. The gypsies were led before them, and the Count announced that he had found them to be innocent of the crimes of which they were accused, and that he would grant them free passage through his domains. To the astonishment of all present, their fetters were struck off, and they were set at liberty. The red-shawled woman was not among them. It was whispered that the gypsy captain, recognizable from the golden chain about his neck and the red feather in his high Spanish hat, had paid a secret visit to the Count's room the night before. But it was discovered a short time after the release of the gypsies that they were indeed guiltless of the robberies and murders that had disturbed the district. The date set for Gabrielle's wedding approached. One day, to her great astonishment, she saw several large wagons in the courtyard being packed high with furniture, clothing, linen, with everything necessary for a complete household outfit. The wagons were driven away, and the following day Count Z explained that, for many reasons, he had thought it best to grant Angelica's odd request that she be allowed to set up her own establishment in his house in X. He had given the house to her, and had promised her that no member of the family, not even he himself, should enter it without her express permission. He added also that, at her urgent request, he had permitted his own valet to accompany her, to take charge of her household. When the wedding festivities were over, Count Z and his bride departed for their home, where they spent a year in cloudless happiness. Then, the Count's health failed mysteriously. It was as if some secret sorrow gnawed at his vitals, robbing him of joy and strength. All efforts of his young wife to discover the source of this trouble were fruitless. At last, when the constantly recurring fainting spells threatened to endanger his very life, he yielded to the entreaties of his physicians and left his home, ostensibly for Pisa. His young wife was prevented from accompanying him by the delicate condition of her own health. And now, said the doctor, the information given me by Countess S. became, from this point on, so rhapsodical that a keen observer only could guess at the true coherence of the story. Her baby, a daughter born during her husband's absence, was spirited away from the house, and all search for it was fruitless. Her grief at this loss deepened to despair when she received a message from her father stating that her husband, whom all believed to be in Pisa, had been found dying of heart trouble in Angelica's home in X, and that Angelica herself had become a dangerous maniac. The old count added that all this horror had so shaken his own nerves that he feared he would not long survive it. As soon as Gabrielle was able to leave her bed, she hurried to her father's castle. And one night, prevented from sleeping by visions of the loved ones she had lost, she seemed to hear a faint crying like that of an infant before the door of her chamber. Lighting her candle, she opened the door. Great heaven, there cowered the old gypsy woman, wrapped in her red shawl, staring up at her with eyes that seemed already glazing in death. In her arms she held a little child, whose crying had aroused the countess. Gabrielle's heart beat high with joy. It was her child, her lost daughter. She snatched the infant from the gypsy's arms, just as the woman fell at her feet, lifeless. The countess's screams awoke the house, but the gypsy was quite dead, and no effort to revive her met with success. The old count hurried to X to endeavor to discover something that would throw light upon the mysterious disappearance and reappearance of the child. Angelica's madness had frightened away all her female servants. The valet alone remained with her. She appeared at first to have become quite calm and sensible, but when the count told her the story of Gabriella's child, she clapped her hands and laughed aloud, crying, "'Did the little darling arrive? "'You buried her, you say?' How the feathers of the gold pheasant shine in the sun. Have you seen the green lion with the fiery blue eyes? Horrified, the Count perceived that Angelica's mind was gone beyond a doubt, and he resolved to take her back with him to his estates in spite of the warnings of his old valet. At the mere suggestion of removing her from the house, Angelica's ravings increased to such an extent as to endanger her own life and that of the others. 
When a lucid interval came again, Angelica entreated her father with many tears to let her live and die in the house she had chosen. Touched by her terrible trouble, he granted her request, although he believed the confession which slipped from her lips during the scene to be a fantasy of her madness. She told him that Count S. had returned to her arms, and that the child which the gypsy had taken to her father's house was the fruit of their love. The rumor went abroad in the city that Count Z. had taken the unfortunate woman to his home, but the truth was that she remained hidden in the deserted house under the care of the valet. Count Z. died a short time ago, and Countess Gabrielle came here with her daughter Edwina to arrange some family affairs. It was not possible for her to avoid seeing her unfortunate sister. Strange things must have happened during this visit, but the Countess has not confided anything to me, saying merely that she found it necessary to take the mad woman away from the old valet. It had been discovered that he had controlled her outbreaks by means of force and physical cruelty, and that also, allured by Angelica's assertions that she could make gold, he had allowed himself to assist her in her weird operations. It would be quite unnecessary, thus the physician ended his story, to say anything more to you about the deeper inward relationship of all these strange things. It is clear to my mind that it was you who brought about the catastrophe, a catastrophe which will mean recovery or speedy death for the sick woman. And now I will confess to you that I was not a little alarmed, horrified even, to discover that, when I had set myself in magnetic communication with you by placing my hand on your neck, I could see the picture in the mirror with my own eyes. We both now know that the reflection in the glass was the face of Countess Edwina. I repeat Dr. K's words in saying that, to my mind also, there is no further comment that can be made on all these facts. I consider it equally unnecessary to discuss at any further length with you now the mysterious relationship between Angelica, Edwina, the old valet, and myself, a relationship which seemed the work of a malicious demon who was playing his tricks with us. I will add only that I left the city soon after all these events, driven from the place by an oppression I could not shake off. The uncanny sensation left me suddenly, a month or so later, giving way to a feeling of intense relief that flowed through all my veins with the warmth of an electric current. I am convinced that this change within me came about in the moment when the mad woman died. What a weird story. To be honest, part of me wanted to edit it before reading and replace some of the honorifics and pronouns with people's names because it gets a bit confusing toward the end. In chronological order, to recap the story, what happens is Count S. falls in love with Angelica and goes to their family home, the castle of Count Z, in order to woo her. While there, he falls in love with Gabrielle instead and becomes engaged to her. Angelica scoffs at their engagement, but then she starts roaming around in the woods by herself. Evidently, she meets and befriends a strange Romany woman in the woods. The troop of Romany are accused of some crime and they're all rounded up, and Angelica swoops in and claims that they're innocent and begs her father to release them, and we see that she and the Romany woman have some kind of relationship. Apparently, also, one of the Romany men visits the Count overnight, and then the Count surprisingly announces that they're all to be released and given free roam of his lands, which is just as well because they were all innocent. Then the Count allows Angelica to pack up a whole household and move off to one of his houses in X, taking with her his servant, and to live independently by herself. My feeling, of course, is that she secretly took the Romany woman with her. This isn't specified in the story, but it makes sense. Then Count S. begins to be sickly and he wastes away. He tells Gabrielle that he's going to Pisa for his health, but apparently he instead secretly goes to X to be with Angelica. While he is away, Gabrielle gives birth to a baby who mysteriously disappears. Then Gabrielle goes to her father's house. In the middle of the night, she hears crying. The Romany woman shows up with a baby in the middle of the night. Gabrielle snatches the baby, assuming that it's her missing daughter, Edwina, and the woman drops dead before she says anything. So because Count S. had died at Angelica's house in X, her father, Count Z, goes there to find out what's going on. 
And he finds out that all the servants have left and it's just her and the valet and she's apparently gone mad. She also says that the baby Edwina is her child with Count S, not Gabrielle's. I think this is probably true because our narrator claims that Edwina and Angelica resemble each other. Count Z is then persuaded to allow Angelica and the valet to keep living alone in X, where apparently she gets crazier and crazier, but also convinces him that she knows magic and she can make gold and they engage in all kinds of weird activities and rituals. Then Count Z dies, so Gabrielle and Edwina go to X to handle the business of his estate, and they go into the house and they are horrified by the state of affairs, and they send away Angelica from the horrible house. The valet gets sick and dies, Angelica gets sick and dies, everybody gets sick and dies. If that recap was unnecessary for you, I apologize. It was actually helpful for me, but it still leaves a bunch of crazy questions. So one line of inquiry is about the Romany magic and what Angelica was doing, enchanting young men and luring them into the house. The little vial of the tiny goldfish, the green lion with the blue eyes, like there's all of this strange stuff happening in the house and we don't really understand what it is or how magical she really is. And of course, the other inquiry is what the heck is going on in this town? The Italian street vendor is selling a magic mirror and Count P being weird and telling him that it's just a candy shop. And of course, the weird old man on the park bench who tells him it's just a picture and he doesn't need to look at it anymore. It all feels very Twilight Zone. Or actually a bit more like The Prisoner, right? Where everyone in town is in on a secret and keeping it from the main character. By the way, The Prisoner was an amazing show. So I've been meaning to get some ETA Hoffman on the channel for a while now, and when better to do it than the Halloween season? Unfortunately, a lot of his stories are very long, especially the more famous ones, and so I've kind of prowled over his work for a while now before I found this one. Hoffman was, of course, one of the pioneers and is the best-known representative of German Romanticism, a genre that heavily influenced English literature. It is said to be the precursor of modern fantasy literature, but of course we can also detect a heavy element of early science fiction. German Romanticism sought to unite the realities of daily life with ideas about the invisible and the supernatural, as well as ideas about, uh, today we would call it psychology, right? Creative genius, the source of ideas and emotions. Hoffman and the German Romantics were working during the era of the Napoleonic Wars, and so there was a certain a tenuousness in their work, an undercurrent of the fragility of culture and civilization. Hoffman himself seems to have been a pretty unlikable guy. He was always being kind of sent somewhere else. He would either develop these weird crushes on women and behave badly, or he would get in trouble with important people because of his weirdness and the war, and also because he was mainly a composer who wrote operettas and stuff, and work in music and opera requires a stable social class who can attend the theater. He had to move around a lot. He lived and worked all over Prussia before dying of syphilis at the age of 46. His work would heavily influence writers like Poe, Kafka, Baudelaire, Dostoevsky, Lovecraft, Although he was born much earlier, a lot of his writing was actually coeval with the work of Mary Shelley and the English Romantics, and we can see those similar themes of attempting to reconcile science and reality with metaphysical and supernatural experiences. And we definitely might see more of Hoffman around here. It is the world's slowest ambulance. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that I went to Italy for a couple of weeks. By the way, it was lovely. My mom and I went to Bologna and Bari and Brindisi, mainly because my local airport makes it easy to fly out to Bologna and back from Brindisi, and we could take the train down the coast and see more of the country in between. Each city was so different with a totally different mood and tone and architecture and environment and lifestyle. It was fascinating and wonderful. But anyway, I came back to so many delightful comments on the channel. You guys are just lovely and reading what everybody had to say really warmed my cold little heart. Partly because, of course, it's taken a long time for the channel to get a little traction. And I was really nervous that there weren't people out there who wanted to engage with these stories in the way that I want to engage with them. 
to look at them individually as their own works of art or of imagination, and then also to look at them a bit in context, where they came from and the culture they refer back to. I don't want to go all the way into academia and pedantry. I just want to kind of lift that curtain and look around a bit to see if there's anything interesting there. I completely understand and appreciate that there are people who just listen to the stories and then click away when I start talking. I get it. But the people who stick around for the yammering part are the people who are most likely to comment and make their own insights and observations. And I find what you guys have to say so interesting. It's so cool to get these different perspectives or gain new information and it's very inspiring. And finally, for those people who find these videos just kind of peaceful and relaxing and a little vacation for a troubled mind, well, I feel so honored to be a part of those moments. In other words, it was lovely to go and not take my computer and not really pay attention to the digital world for a little while, but you guys made it really beautiful to be back, and I'm very touched and very grateful. So if you are still here listening to my sappy speech, you should go ahead and subscribe already. You're one of us. Please also click the like button and consider dropping a comment in the box below. It's a great contribution to the community and it does help other people find the channel. Thank you so, so much for the support, everybody. And I will see you in a few days. Mwah.